Good morning, Breakfast Club viewers. We hope that you are doing well. This is episode 41, and we are incredibly um, excited and lucky to welcome Senior Collections Manager Maureen Mo Flannery. Hey, Mo. Hey there. Uh, so thank you so much for coming back. You were briefly on Nightlife the um, last Thursday, and we did a little bit of arm twisting to get you here because you're oh, like pretty busy and in very, very high demand. Um, so today we will we'll be doing a virtual tour of the Ornithology and Mammalogy collections, also known as Birds and Mammals, um, and super excited to get started. But before that, uh, uh, an exciting announcement. Um, we have a reopening date. So the Academy will be opening first to members and donors from October 13th to 22nd, and then with a full public reopening on October 23rd. So huge thanks to everybody who supported us during this time with donations and memberships and just with watching shows like this. We hope that you will come visit if you can, if you're in the area. Um, and if not, please just keep uh, interacting with us and watching shows like this, because we're gonna keep them going. So um, with that, uh, Mo, can you tell us, like, I guess an overview of uh, birds and mammals would be a great place to start. Sure, so I'm gonna actually go through kind of exactly the tour that I give to people when they come visit the collection because I've been working from home for so many months, I have not given a tour. So typically we give tours to university students who are studying biology or uh, museum studies, or in a lot of cases like ornithology or marine mammalogy. Um, and sometimes we give tours to donors. So this is something that's really special. Not everybody gets to come in the collection, but I do love to give them. So here we are in the, the main entryway to the ornithology and mammalogy collection. And a lot of people don't even know that behind the scenes of the main exhibit floor, the Academy has eight research collections that contain over 46 million specimens. Now in birds and mammals, we have 100,000 birds 32,000 mammals and 11,000 eggs and nests. So we're kind of a small collection compared to things like botany or entomology. Like entomology, they can go out and pick up a handful of leaves and debris and they have lots and lots of specimens in that handful. For us, we have to do things like go out and cut open an 87 foot whale on the beach just to get one bone that's like this big. So our collection varies in the types of specimens that we have and um, the number of parts for each individual specimen. So when, when I have little competitions with other collection managers about how many specimens they have, I like to say, well, like, one of my skeletons has 200 individual bones, but it still only counts as one. So right. really we should count every bone, but we're definitely not gonna do that because that would be too much work. It does seem fair though, from a competitive like point of view. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and our specimens, um, we collect them mostly by salvage. So most of the time recently, unless we have a specific study in mind. We don't actually go out and actively collect. Um, some museums do, and we have in the past. Um, I've been collecting in places like China and in uh, the desert in Nevada. So it all depends on what kind of projects you're doing, if you're doing an inventory or a biodiversity study. Um, but in general, now a lot of our specimens come in by salvage. So birds that hit buildings, um, animals like uh, river otters that are killed by cars on the roads and a lot of things that wash up on the beaches. So dead marine mammals and seabirds and things that wash up on the beaches. So we get the carcass, sometimes not fresh, but not, <laughs> hopefully it's mostly fresh. And then we have to go from that carcass into the many specimens uh, that we have in the collection. And let me just show you a couple of different types of specimens just to begin with here. So I am going to, you can see behind me just kind of in broad <clears throat> broad strokes here, there's a couple of uh, birds behind me. I'm gonna get a little closer so you can see them. Oh, here, I gotta show you this wall. This is the wall we're gonna walk past. That's a horned specimen wall. Those are some heart of beast. But this here, is a female lyrebird. So this is called a mount. 
a mounted specimen. So we don't typically mount everything because you can see from this wire bird, there's the female and the male behind her. They take up a lot of space when they're mounted, but they're great for public display. So when you go on the main floor again, um, you can see in uh, Color of Life and in Giants of Land and Sea, we have several mounted specimens up there. And then if we move back from there, there is a horned bill and a great horned owl. And then there's a cat skeleton, a couple of pelicans, one with skin and one skeleton and an albatross. And then way in the back there is an African elephant skull. So that's just kind of a, a little taste of some of the specimen types of specimens that we have. Um, our collection ranges in size from things like the 87 foot long blue whale that's up on the main exhibit floor to teeny, teeny, tiny hummingbird eggs that are down a few rows um, in, the, in the museum. So I might take this opportunity to move us. We're going to go down and visit some of the specimens down below. Okay, excellent. The moving is actually a really fun process to watch. So Yeah, so I like to think of myself as a librarian, but instead of taking care of books, I take care of dead things, basically. And just like a library, we have compactors. Which some of you may have seen in some of the other collections. So in this room, we have bird study skins, bird skeletons, bird eggs and nests, uh, mammal study skin, mammal skeletons, and um, some mounted specimens. We have several other rooms. Maybe someday we can do another visit and go to those rooms. But um, we have a room that has birds in jars, similar to what you probably saw with the herpetology collection and mammals in jars. And then we have a pelt cooler that has some large pelt and also has some very big things like a huge grizzly bear in the pelt room and also Monarch, who was the last grizzly bear in California. He's housed in our pelt room. Maybe someday, if you talk me into it, we can go down. There. Oh, it's I'll talk super to you tight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd love to show it. Not even we never take tours in there because there, it's a very tight, tight space in the yeah. belt room. Oh, and we have an antler room. So similar to those heart of beasts that you saw hanging on the wall, the antler room is completely full of antlered specimens and also some of our large specimens like uh, orca specimens and we have a dugong skeleton down there too as well so, so cool. that would be a fun room to visit but this is our main collection room and there are 10 rooms just this size in the academy that house all the specimens that make up the academy collection um, Mo, I wanted to ask um, quickly, and just a quick note to viewers too, you can ask questions live anytime by leaving them in the comment section on Facebook or the chat box on YouTube. But Mo, what determines whether a, how a specimen is prepared? So whether it's mounted or be, treated as a study skin or in a, goes in a jar? So um, we basically determine how many of that specimen we already have in the collection and from where the condition that it comes in so if we find a very rare bird on the beach um, and it's, but it's all like rotting and it's been scavenged, we'll make just a skull from that because you can't make a, a study skin. Mounted specimens we really only do nowadays if we're hosting an exhibit. So if we know we need a particular animal for an exhibit, sometimes we'll get them from rehab facilities we also get some of our salvage from rehab facilities. So a place like uh, Wild Care in Marin County or the Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito, if an animal is brought in sick and does not survive, sometimes they'll save them for us to add to the collection. So up in the Giants of Land and Sea exhibit, we actually have some barred owl specimens that were part of uh, rehab and a spotted owl that came from rehab as well. Okay. So 
I'm going to open the drawer. So here at the Academy, we have one of the largest collections of Galapagos finches and Galapagos birds in general in the world. And that was because in 1905 and 1906, a team of eight scientists traveled to the Galapagos. And during that two year period, they collected everything. They collected plants and uh, tortoises and other herbs and birds and a few mammals. There aren't many mammals on the Galapagos. And while they were in the Galapagos, um, the earthquake happened in San Francisco in 1906, which burned everything that was in the Academy collection, which were down on Market Street at the time. So those individual men brought back the new Academy of Sciences when they came back from the Galapagos. And they brought back over 78,000 specimens. So of those specimens, we have probably about 6,000 bird, Galapagos birds. So this is what a main case looks like. And they're just a bunch of drawers that open up and have specimens in them. So let me get a close-up look for you. When they came back with these birds, that was the Academy collection. And now we have about 60% of the birds from the Galapagos in any museum collections are housed here at the Academy. And so that means that those specimens are now available to researchers from all over the world because it's not very easy to travel to the Galapagos. So this is kind of our fancy tray of Galapagos finches. So this is a male and a female of each species. And Galapagos birds have been heavily studied by researchers to study natural selection. So Darwin uh, wrote his origin of species based on birds in the Galapagos. The finches kind of get the credit for giving Darwin his idea for um, natural selection, but really it was the mockingbirds. Darwin actually didn't even know that these were finches, um, but he noticed on the mockingbirds that individual birds, even though they were related, had different characteristics. So you can see here is a large ground finch, male, and you can see he has a really huge bill and also a very large body. So he eats things like um, big, large seeds that are hard to crack. And then on another area of the Galapagos Islands, you might see this sharp beak ground finch. So a cousin of the large bill, uh, the large ground finch, but not very similar yet. Yeah, it's it's um, changed its it's evolved to eat smaller things and with that nice small bill there. So that's a good comparison of the two. So this is kind of our show off tray just to show the different species. Let me show you what a typical tray looks like. You're still seeing all this, right, Laurel? Yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, good. I heard a little something in the background. So this is what a typical tray looks like. Um, lots of individuals of different species from different places at different periods of time. So someone might ask, and they might have asked already, why do you have to have so many? Because that's a question that a lot of people ask. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, if you were doing a Zoom call and you were on the screen, you know, there's what, like, 30, 40 people, 50, I don't know how many Zoom can fit, but there's 50 people on your screen and you pick two people from that screen and you say, everybody who's on this Zoom call, in fact, everybody in this field looks exactly like these two people. You would be incorrect. And so as scientists, we cannot just work with one or two individual specimens of a species in order to be accurate and precise, we need to have lots of individuals from different areas in order to see the differences um, in speciation and in individual variation and in the relationship to each other. And from different time periods too, so we can see the changes over time. 
So this is what a typical tray looks like. And then I have some other ones to share. So here I pulled out a couple of individual specimens. So these are also Galapagos finches, but these were used in a really cool study that is a great example for why we have the specimens in the collection that we do. So uh, researcher Patty Parker was studying avian pox, which is a disease that birds in the Galapagos still have today. And they get lesions on their feet. So I'm gonna try and show you. This bird has a lesion on its foot right at the tip of my um, tweezers. You can see kind of a bump there. And then this bird has just a regular foot. That's a normal foot. So this one from uh, 1905 has a lesion and this one doesn't. So Patty asked, how did avian pox get to the Galapagos Islands? And she came to our collection and she looked at hundreds of Galapagos finches and she recorded which ones had avian pox lesions and which ones didn't. And then because she had a genetics laboratory, we let her take a tiny piece of that toe pad that's called destructive sampling. And we're very careful about it because we want to keep these for 100, 200, 500 years. Um, and she was able to amplify DNA of the avian pox virus in the toe pad of the bird. Now, generally, people do genetic studies looking at the species itself. Um, how different species have evolved over time and how they're related to each other genetically. But she was actually able to look at the virus in the foot of a bird from 1905 and 1906. And what it told her based on how many birds had it and the dates that they were collected was that avian pox arrived on the Galapagos sometime around the late 1800s and that it was similar genetically to what you find in caged canaries. So we don't know the exact story, but you can hypothesize that, you know, an early settler brought over a caged canary that had avian pox lesions, and then the virus spread from the caged canary, starting at Chatham Island, she figured that out um, genetically as well, to the other islands on the Galapagos. So back in 1905 and 1906, when the scientists, the eight men, were in the Galapagos collecting all these specimens. They had no idea about DNA, right? We didn't learn about that till the 1950s. They didn't know what Patty Parker was gonna be studying in 2004, almost 100 years later. They probably couldn't have even imagined a female scientist working with the specimens that they were working with. So it's my job as the collections manager here to make sure that these specimens are still here for future researchers to be able to do whatever studies that they come up with um, at the time that we can't even imagine right now, just like those guys um, in 1905 and 1906. So we're very lucky to have the Galapagos uh, collection here. Well, that's, um, that's incredible. Um, yeah, such a good example of historic collections answering a current question, which happens all the time, even though people don't hear about it very much. But um, so from YouTube, we had a question What's, what is the oldest specimen in your collection? Ah, I just actually looked that up the other day because I never really have thought about that, which is strange. So because we lost everything in 1905 and 1906, or 1906 in the fire and earthquake, you would think that we don't have anything from before then. But we actually received orphan collections over the years after we reestablished the academy. So the oldest specimens in the collection uh, for birds, there's a goth hawk, <clears throat> excuse me, from Germany from 1940. And there's also a set of eggs somewhere over here um, of a water, northern water thrush from 1940 as well from New York. And then in the mammals, the oldest one is a mouse from Syria from, I'm sorry, did I say 1940? You meant actually. 1840, I met 1840, which is way more interesting than 1940. I was, I was actually shocked when I saw that. So those two, the birds and the eggs are 1840, and the mouse is from 1846, 
from Syria. And those were all donations from other um, places. We actually received the Stanford collection back in the 1960s and 70s. Stanford decided it didn't have space for a natural history collection. So their birds and mammals came here and a lot of the older specimens come from the Stanford collection. So I'm gonna show you some of our eggs just because we're right here. Let me, it's on the other side. So you um, I'll switch to the little camera. So here's another case. So egg collecting was a, primarily a hobby that was done by young boys generally in the early 1900s. So nowadays everything is protected. Birds are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So it's illegal for anyone to go out and collect eggs and keep their own collections. But prior to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, people would um, collect eggs. They would trade them with each other, kind of like baseball cards. Um, and they would eventually make their way into research collections. And a couple of, or one really interesting study with eggs was um, when researchers were seeing that peregrine falcons in the 70s were not able to reproduce, they were endangered, and their eggs were cracking at the time. Um, researchers wanted to know why are the eggs cracking when, you know, when the adults just sit on them. And so they went to museum collections and they measured the thickness of eggs pre-DDT and post-DDT. And that actually showed that eggshells had thinned with the use of the pesticide. And so that was instrumental in getting that pesticide banned here in the US. So egg collections are interesting. They're not used as much as other specimens in the collection, um, but they're really beautiful. Yeah, they're stunning. Yeah, okay. We're gonna move down again to another fun area. Sticking with birds for the minute. Mo, Emma asked um, how the eggs are preserved. Are they literally just sitting safely in those small boxes or is there anything else in play? So have you ever blown eggs for Easter? It's uh -huh. similar to that, um, but instead of making kind of a hole at the top and a hole at the bottom, the scientists just make one hole so that they look a little bit um, more like a whole egg without a hole in the bottom and the top. Um, but it's kind of a lost art. Like I am terrible, terrible at preserving eggs. <laughs> we do sometimes try and do it. I have a couple of uh, staff members and volunteers that are really good at it. I am off all. It's really, really hard because you don't actually, like you can't stick a syringe in there and get the egg material out of it. And you also have to know who, you have to see the bird, the parents, and you, it's good to get the eggs early on. So I'm just really bad at it. It's, well, it's a lost art. But there is a museum, the Western Foundation of Vertebrate Zoology. We only have 11,000 eggs in nests here. They have over 250,000. So they're really good at it. <laughs> We're not, I'm not. <laughs> I mean, you speak Chinese and you are incredibly interesting and you <laughs> wade into whale guts up to your elbows. So I feel like we yeah. can forgive you that one. You forgive me for the egg. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe I can forgive myself too. So I'm going to show you some birds of paradise. These are really stunning specimens. So wow. this is one tray of birds of paradise. Birds, birds of paradise are only found in Papua New Guinea. And there are, I believe, 39 species of them. And if, if you have time and you really want to watch some fun videos, the um, Bird of Paradise project was done by Cornell and National Geographic, and they have amazing videos of these guys. So we talked about natural selection earlier when we talked about Galapagos finches and their bills. So Birds of Paradise, these guys are all related to each other, but they have all developed different feather strategies for attracting a mate. 
So this one has these head plumes that it swings around when it's performing for the females. This one here has an extra cape and you can kind of, can you see the iridescence on the head there? Mm -hmm. That, so it like sparkles its iridescent head at the female to try and attract it. So these birds are an excellent example of sexual selection. And the next tray is even more amazing. These are also birds of paradise. They do this crazy dance with these modified feathers. Um, so birds of paradise were, well, a lot of birds were used for human use early on. So this specimen you can see may have come from say a woman's hat or something like that. The way that it's positioned, it might've been on somebody's um, hat or um, something like, this back here, let me open the tray a little. This, um, a fancy woman in the 1900s would have maybe worn in her hair or on her um, dress somewhere. And that was before, you know, we, they had plastics to actually um, make think, nice accessories for people to wear. Mm -hmm. So these birds came to us from the De Young Museum across the street. So the De Young actually had a natural history collection. Um, but what happens with things that were on display at some point, sometimes they lose their data. So the two most important things as a scientist are where an animal was collected and when. And that tells us um, their place in history on this earth. And so um, these don't have a when, but they do have a where because we know that birds of paradise only come from Papua New Guinea. And we don't have any other specimens of these, this group. So that's why we have them here in the collection. This is one of my favorites. I'm not sure how it's gonna show here, but can you see the beautiful iridescence? Oh, we can, yeah. Uh, in the light. Mm -hmm. So this is another bird of paradise. This is called, I love that rust color around the chest feathers there. Yeah. This is, um, her, its name is Stephanie's Atropa. I'm not exactly sure it's named after somebody. But this one has a really nice long tail. And this is a great example of a type of evolution called convergent evolution. So if, if you know Quetzal that live in Central America, they are a very showy bird also with a very long tail. So they developed that over time. And this bird of paradise also developed that very long tail. But both of them developed them in completely different places in the world. So that is an example of convergent evolution where um, two characteristics are evolving but on two totally different places but they come together at, as the same characteristic in the end. And Mo, Brielle asked were the, so when you showed the birds that had been worn on hats or clothing, were those preserved differently or were they preserved before they were worn or are they just? No, they're pretty much just dried the same way that okay. all the other ones are. So um, to prepare a bird specimen, uh, we basically make an incision down the chest of the bird when it's a, a thawed out carcass. And then we turn it inside out, kind of like pulling your sweatshirt over your head. And then we take most of the soft parts out. The wings are still there and the legs are still there. So you still have some bones. And researchers actually will take measurements of the leg, the tarsus of the leg, some of the nails and things, um, the bill and the skull are still in there. And then we stuff it full of cotton if it's small enough, or if it's a bigger bird, we have to use other types of material. And then we just let them dry. Now I'm wearing gloves because these birds historically were prepared with arsenic. And so um, I'm gonna wash my hands, of course, anyways, these days. Uh, but before I eat lunch, um, 
but that was a preservative that they used to, to keep them from attracting pests. Nowadays, we can't really use arsenic. We don't really use any chemicals. We just dry the specimens. And then we have to diligently monitor uh, the cases to make sure that no pests get in. We also try and keep this room at about 65 degrees and hopefully around 50% relative humidity. So temperature control, um, pest checks, humidity control. And then also you can see the specimens are kept in these closed cases. So that helps if there's an earthquake, we won't end up with birds all over the floor, but also it keeps them in the dark so that they don't fade from light. There's actually one bird of paradise in here that's really interesting to me as a caretaker of specimens. So this one, oh, I have to turn on that other camera because this one is totally amazing. And now I'm like, Doing a different plan. So this one, I mean, look, at, it's very white. These feathers are very white. And it, well, it has, this is a 12 wire bird of paradise. So you can see those 12 wires hanging off of the tail. And the rest of the bird is white and black. This bird actually in the wild is a beautiful yellow color. However, it's one of the few pigments that actually fades in the dark. And so when I first was looking at this 12 wire bird of paradise, I was like, oh, we have a different species of 12 wire <laughs> bird of paradise in our drawer. And that's how scientists thought, you know, years when they were first discovering things like, oh my God, there's a white one here. That's a different species. Well, then I did a little bit of reading and realized that it actually has just faded. And all of our individuals of that species no longer show any yellow. Um, most other colors though do stay permanently on feathers. It um, just depends on if it's a structural color or if it's a, a pigment. You ready to go to some mammal bones? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, you can ask questions while we go if you want. I do if want. Anybody has any they do. Um, so as you roll past all of these cabinets, Laura asked, what happens when CAS runs out of our runs out of specimen storage space? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to build a new building. And yeah. that's actually not not far in the future. Um, right. some collections have a little more space than others starting off. We are because we have so many different size things and they're some really big things, we're probably going to run out in the next 10 years. So we'll probably end up having a big capital campaign to build some more specimen storage. Right. So Get ready. You can all start saving, saving your pennies. I guess uh, mammalogy probably has a wider range in terms of size of the kind of specimens it has to house. Is that right? Absolutely. Tiny yeah. little mice skins and skulls like shrew skulls and bat skulls are so small and then you you saw the elephant skull and mm -hmm. so we're gonna go back down the mammal aisle excellent we have time for one more question or should i yeah, sure. so um brian asked specific to skulls when you're preparing one do you use flesh eating dermestid beetles or other methods uh, we do have dermestid beetles um, it depends on the type of skull. So for a large marine mammal that we get on the beach, in certain species we'll actually use maceration, which is basically you remove most of the muscle and the brain and the fur, and you put the skull into a bucket of water. And then the bacteria in the water just degrades the uh, soft tissue, and then you end up with a nice clean skull. So most things, that's what we do. Um, but there are certain specimens like bird skeletons. Um, birds have a bony eye ring. If we put them in maceration, it would just fall apart into pieces. So we want those to stay together. So they'll go through the domestic beetles. Porpoises and dolphins will go through the domestic beetles because they have um, their teeth. They're called homodonts. All of their teeth look exactly the same. 
and there's no way to fit them into different um, areas. I can show you a heterodont while we're here. This is a wolf skull. So we're in the mammal section now, the larger mammal bone. Um, and in this section, we have everything. Actually, the whole collection is organized by taxonomic order. So who's most closely related to each other? So this is a wolf. And you can see all of the teeth look a little, they're different. And they're like a lock and key mechanism. And so if those teeth fall out in the maceration tank, it's not a big deal. We know exactly where they sit back into the specimen. So part of our process is you clean it in maceration. Then it goes through uh, sodium perborate to whiten them a little bit. And then they go through ammonia. Sometimes if they're super greasy, that helps pull some of the grease out. Sometimes we actually use salt water for cleaning skulls because that's a really good way to get some of the fat out of marine mammal specimens. And um, then we have to glue the teeth together. Sometimes we have to glue the whole skull together because young animals, their skulls will fall apart. So for young animals, we'll either put them through the dermestids or we'll, um, if we can put them back together like a puzzle, we do lots of uh, Guadalupe first field puzzles around here, putting these young animals back together. Um, but once you've done it a few times, you kind of have an idea. So I'm gonna show you our walruses while I put this guy away. So um, we had a, a researcher, a field researcher, field volunteer, Raymond Bandar, he collected skulls beginning in 1953. This really big, beautiful walrus came from his collection. And so did this little tiny one. So he started collecting before there were things like permits. And he collected over um, 7,000 specimens of all different things in his lifetime. And when he died in 2017, his entire collection came here to the academy. So we're still in the process of integrating it in, but um, it's just amazing the specimens that we received from him. So this is a young walrus skull and below it on the shelf, this is a walrus penis bone. So it's a baculum. And we actually use bacula as pieces of evidence that we actually identified the individual's gender correctly. So this is a piece of data. So when we collect a skull on the beach of a male animal, we actually um, will collect the penis bone as well. So that tells future researchers that we actually identified the species correctly to gender. <laughs> I know. That probably surprised a lot of people drinking their coffee this morning. Yeah. Well, and that the walrus is particularly um, large. Yeah. So I'm gonna walk down here. So we have hyenas and wolves and dogs, domestic dogs, walruses. Um, and that, then we get into the elephant seals. I'm gonna bring this northern elephant seal out. And I'm gonna drop a link to our Sketchfab channel in comments right now, because oh, it, yeah. yeah, it has 3D images of a lot of the skulls that Mo's showing and they're really incredible to. So much fun to manipulate and play around with and everything, just incredible. I think over 700 skulls on the sketch web. Yep, 705. Yep, I've looked at them a lot. So this is a Northern Elephant Seal skull, um, also from the Ray Dandar collection. And you can see on this one that it has these really beautiful nasal turbinates. So we actually have those in our noses too. It's their bony structures in our nose that are covered with membrane and with little cilia. And that's what helps clean our air as we breathe in and breathe out. And these guys have amazing teeth, wow. canines. And then they have these little stubby peg-like post canines. 
which, I mean, they just suck their fish in so they're not actually chewing. Actually, most marine mammals just grab their food and then suck it down. Um, but as far as preparing a skull, those teeth are just really not fun for, for us to work with because, again, they're not a lock in key. So we have to pull each individual tooth out and put it in a little uh, piece of styrofoam until we clean the entire skull and then we have to put them back in the right order. <laughs> so uh, these guys are kind of challenging. But we have uh, over 120 specimens of northern elephant seals. And then we have harbor seals here. And we have the world's largest collection of South, uh, California sea lions, over 3,000 California sea lions in the collection. And that's primarily because of Ray Bandar. He collected thousands of them during his time. So we're part of the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. And that means that we are authorized by the National Marine Fisheries Service to respond to any dead marine mammal along the coast. We basically work from on you know um, the Santa Cruz, yeah, on Nuevo Island in the south, all the way to Rockport in Mendocino County. We work with a group in Mendocino called the Noyo Center for Marine Sciences, and they respond help us by responding to marine mammals up there. And we collect data that we submit to uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, about 300 animals a year um, we respond to. And then we collect specimens from a select few of those, usually about 100 a year. We'll add skulls and penis wounds in the case of a male or um, just a skull for a female to our collection each year. So we have a nice representative of each species over time from the Bay Area um, here in the museum. And researchers come and use these specimens for all sorts of studies. There's a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz, Anna Valenzuela Tora, and she is working on um, California sea lions and how they've changed it over time and whether their skull size has changed. Mm -hmm. And I think she's measured like over 1200 of our California sea lion skulls. And um, she has shown that over time, their skull size has changed and thus their body size has changed. And I'm waiting for her to finish her thesis so I can figure out why that's okay. happened. Are they getting smaller um, or larger? The males are getting larger. <gasps> yeah. And actually, we've seen a shift in demographics of stranding. So back when Ray was running around on the beaches, up until like about the mid uh, 2000, we mostly saw males <clears throat> here in the Bay Area, California sea lions, adult males and juvenile males. And then we started seeing more and more females um, stranding. Some of that is due to demoic acid poisoning that they get from um, agricultural runoff. But um, it could also be a shift in the population size and more females in the area where they weren't years ago. Uh, we saw, we've also seen shift in Guadalupe fur seals. Several years ago, our Guadalupe fur seal collection was only about 27 Guadalupe fur seals. And then in 2015, we started seeing a lot of dead Guadalupe fur seals all along the California coast. So other stranding network organizations and us communicated and we realized hmm, there's something going on. All these young Guadalupe fur seals are washing up dead or they're in rehab facilities. And so NOAA declared what's called an unusual mortality event, which brings a team of investigators together to gather data and to look at all of the different possibilities of what might be affecting that marine mammal group. So we've been involved in the Guadalupe fur seal investigation for five years now. And any Guadalupe fur seal that washes up dead anywhere in California, and even some in Washington and Oregon, come here to the museum. So now we have North America's largest collection of Guadalupe fur seals cataloged. I think we have like 200 now, which still sounds like a small amount, but going from 27 to over 200 in just a short period of time. And that doesn't include all the ones that are clean and are sitting on the shelves over there. 
right. waiting to be cataloged because that's the final step. Once things are cleaned, they get boxed and then they get cataloged. And once they're cataloged, they get numbered. So let me show you what a whole specimen numbered. We're doing okay on time. Yeah, we don't have any limits or anything. That's perfect. Okay, so this is an entire sea otter skeleton in a box. That That's is every bone. <laughs> yeah, from a public perspective. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, each bone is numbered with the catalog number. It's probably upside down. Right side up. Mm -hmm. So archaeologists can come from a big site with a bone that they need to compare and they can pull out a piece of different species that they need to identify. Or there's a researcher from UC Berkeley who's studying sea otter feet and asymmetry between males and females, asymmetry in individuals, and then how ace if males and females are more asymmetrical than each other. Um, so she would come and she would look at this entire foot and pull out all the bones and measure each bone. But each bone is numbered so that, God forbid, there's an earthquake. Things get back in the right boxes. We do have bars on the shelves to hopefully limit that. But then also if a researcher is working with different specimens, they can get them all in the right place. And then this one. Sometimes the specimen can tell us a little bit about how the animal died. And this one is um, right at the tip of my finger. There's a shark tooth embedded in the, in the skull. Can you guys see that? Yep. Yeah. So it was, oh, there, that's a little bit more yeah. visible. You can see it poking out on the side. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So that, yeah. So when they, when they prepped the specimen, and this came from the Department of Fish and Game down in Santa Cruz, um, they do the necropsies on sea otter specimens. And then um, many of them are archived here. So we also have the world's largest collection of southern sea otters here in the museum. Um, so that gives us a little bit of an idea of why that sea otter died or how that sea otter died. Right. Yeah. And shark bites are a kind of a major thing for sea otters. In the past few years, like 50% of the otters that have washed up dead in California have shown signs of um, shark bite. And part of that is because um, great white sharks are doing really well, so their populations are really expanding. And Sharktober night school next week. Uh, does anybody love sharks? I'm sure it's going to be a great, fun evening of sharks and beer, too. Definitely. Um, yeah. So I'm looking forward to it. But I and I love sharks, even though they bite hmm. the otters. Um, they bite them basically by accident, just the same way that they bite humans by accident. They're really looking for things like a young elephant seal, a wiener elephant seal that is really fat and blubbery. and when they bite the sea otter, they're like, oh, I just got some, I mean, I don't know exactly what they're thinking, but they, no, get a million, they get a million hairs per square inch when they bite a sea otter. So they don't consume it because why would they eat something that doesn't have fat when they really want a fat elephant seal? And the elephant seal populations are doing really well. Like there's over 250,000 elephant seals um, out in the wild now. and Elephant seals got down to about a hundred animals yeah. in the early 1900s because they were hunted for their um, blubber, basically. And sea otter, southern sea otters got down to about 50 animals. So they've both come back since the early 1900s, but elephant seals to this um, exponential amount with over hundreds of thousands of them. And sea otters have really only come back to about 3,000. That's why sea otters are protected under the Endangered Species Act. They're listed as threatened. 
all marine mammals are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, but some of them are also um, under the Endangered Species Act. So just their life history strategies are so different and mm -hmm. that's what's made elephant seals really be able to reproduce and thrive, whereas sea otters are having a much more difficult time. Mm -hmm. A sea otter mom will spend like, you know, six to nine months nursing and caring for her pup. And uh, I'll show you a pelt because I do have a pelt here. Also, Laura wanted to know who does all the work of numbering. Oh, wait, let's look oh. at the pelt. <laughs> you know, I can answer that. Our okay. volunteers, typically our volunteers and students um, we'll do all the numbering. So this is a sea otter pelt. You can see how someone may have, uh, re back before Gore-Tex and everything, people needed warm clothes and this would make a nice coat, which is fine as long as it's subsistence, you know, back in the days, but they went a little bit crazy. Right. And that's why sea otters got so low. And then this sea otter, you can see from the inside when you turn it over, was bitten by a shark. So you can't really see it from the outside with all the fur, but you can see that shark bite. And once they break the skin and cause internal injuries, the sea otters can't really recover from that. Right. So that's kind of unfortunate. But. Mo, did the, the, the kind of good news that you shared about the elephant seals and to some extent the sea otters, is that because of the protections that you mentioned or was there Absolutely. another? Yeah, the protections really have a lot to do with that. So hunting stops and species are able to recover naturally without the pressures from uh, humans. There are still some pressures on them, especially on sea otters. Uh, things like to they can get Toxoplasma gondii, which comes from cats. And if people flush their cat litter down the drain, the toxoplasma actually survives through the um, sewage treatment plant and can get released out into the ocean. And that's detrimental to sea otters. And then there's other issues like microcystin, which is the disease that they get from agricultural runoff that causes um, excessive algal growth in the coastal waters. So we really need to keep our, our waters clean in order to make better habitat for um, Southern sea otters. So hopefully they can expand. Yeah. Um, purple sea otter skull. Can we do yes, a purple please. skull? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. So sea otters have um, about a hundred different um, food choices that they can eat. But uh, typically they'll have a favorite, just like you and I might have a favorite. And when they have a favorite, a mom will actually teach her pup to eat that favorite food. And so, That's okay. um, yeah, and they have to eat 25 to 30% of their um, body weight in food every day. I don't know if the color is going to show up on this table. I might have to hold them individually. Can you guys tell the difference between these two skulls? Of course, I'm like moving elements. This is a white skull that did not eat the same food as this. Let me see if I get on this side if the light is any better. We can this definitely skull, see it. You can see that it's purple. Yeah. And if I show you the teeth, which I cannot manipulate there, those yeah. teeth are actually purple at the base of the teeth versus this one. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm in a weird angle where the teeth are really white. Yeah. So if a great. Southern Sea Otter decides that it really, 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 really likes purple sea urchins, then its skull and sometimes even the bones, the rest of the bones in the body. So this one actually has a spacula that's a little bit purple in the box. Um, their bones will actually turn purple. And then this one also has um, 
osteoarthritis of the TM joint. So sometimes people have TMJ issues with their temporal mandibular joint. And on this specimen, like this one, the mandibles are completely separated. They've, they've come out of the joint and they're in the box. Easily they came out. On this one, you might be able to see there's a bunch of bone grown up around mm -hmm. the lower mandible. And so that shows um, osteoarthritis of the temporal mandibular joint. So there's some researchers, whoops, there goes a tooth. <laughs> that tooth is not well glued in. That is something we'll have oh, to Oh, wow. Do. It's. I know. Can you see how purple that tooth is at the base? Yeah. Also, the root is just so, like, it just, it's so incredible. It almost looks like yeah. it's on both ends. That's the canine tooth. That's so really incredible on these guys yeah. they have those flat molars for crunching things and then they have these beautiful canines yeah i'm really glad that fell off just now <laughs> i'm not but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> this will be gluing that one in right after this make sure that doesn't happen again um because you'd probably notice that that tooth is not numbered Right. So I only have two out, so it'd be pretty obvious which one that one belongs to. Yeah. <laughs> it's purple. But um, some researchers from UC Davis, every almost every summer, they have vet students that are studying animal dentition. I didn't even know there were vet dentists before yeah. they started coming down. And they've gone through all a lot of species in our collection where we have hundreds and hundreds of individuals. And they look at the teeth, you know. Kind of like when you're at the dentist and they're counting your twos, threes, twos, threes for your gum line. They looked at all the teeth and looked for oral pathologies and um, problems with their teeth. And in our sea otters, something like 90% of the sea otters had issues with their teeth, whether it's things like broken teeth or um, 74 of them, 74%, they looked at over a thousand sea otters. 74% of them had gum disease. So there was some sign that the gums had receded and the bones had suffered. And then only 4% of the sea otters had this osteoarthritis of the TM joint. They did the California sea lion and they looked at, you know, eight, a hundred or so California sea lions. And they too had a lot of uh, dental pathologies, things like supernumerary teeth, which are extra teeth that just like they'll have teeth growing out of the top of their palate, extra little teeth or extra teeth incisors on the bottom, or sometimes they have extra post canines. And uh, the California sea lions actually had a really high percentage of them had um, pathologies of the TM joint, like much higher. I can't remember exactly, but somewhere up in the 60 to 70 percent had problems with their temporal mandibular joint. So very different and very different species. Like you could, there, there are some sea lions that we have that have osteoarthritis all in the jaw and you, or broken jaws that have healed. It's really amazing. And by having such a huge sample size, we can see that kind of individual variation that we wouldn't necessarily see if we just, you know, had 30 California sea lions. We have 3,000 right. or more. So, right. yeah. was that, I mean, the prevalence of the teeth problems, does that have any, is that connected at all to why they would have been more likely to, to die and wash up? It depends. Just, if, I, I mm. don't think it necessarily does, but some of them, um, you know, did have abscesses and things that you could see, like the tooth was gone and, or the tooth was completely rotted. That mm -hmm. probably contributed, um, but it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them do, um, we end up getting them from the Marine Mammal Center. And actually the cool thing that um, you can do with teeth in mammals is you can cut the tooth in half and then you can count the layers of dentin and cementum. And that tells you how old the animal is. And then oh, wow. researchers, yeah, can even um, like say we have sperm whale teeth that are like this big. They cut them in half and then they count the layers to see how old the sperm whale was. But they also took a diamond drill and drilled out each 
layer. So they got the dust from each layer. And then they did stable isotope analysis on that each layer. And that told them where in the ocean, you know, depth and latitude and everything that the animal was feeding during that period of time. So, and kind of what they were feeding on. So really cool study. That's that you mind blowing. Yeah, you could do from a tooth or baleen too, baleen. So for whales that don't have teeth, they have a filtering system called baleen that sits in their mouth and filters out um, krill from the water. And their baleen actually, it's ker keratin just like our hair and our fingernails. It also can be used for stable isotope analysis and hormone analysis. You don't get the whole life history of the animal from baleen because it frays on the edges as they feed. But you can get in some species like 16 years of information. So like a blue whale piece of baleen, you can see when she's had babies over the last 16 years and uh, where she's been feeding by the stable isotopes and the hormones from uh, taking little core samples. That's amazing. Baleen. Yeah, very cool. Wow. One more specimen. This is our last specimen? This is the last one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's so many. I could I could show them all day, but I know. Let's just do that. <laughs> Way better than going to work, right? Agreed. Yeah. Okay. So let me turn on the cam this camera. This is um, one of my favorites. see what you can see in the box. This is a Ganges river dolphin. Wow. Entire skeleton. So I am going to pull out the skull. Hopefully and put it on the table. <laughs> yeah, so this one, okay, so it's a dolphin. So it has homodont teeth remember I mentioned that earlier and that means that all their teeth are the same and this one just has crazy teeth I mean those teeth are absolutely incredible yeah so they live in the murky river of the Ganges and they um they're uh the same type of predators that alligators are I'm forgetting the term when you when they sit and wait. Oh, ambush ambushed, predators? Yeah, yeah, ambush predators. And they have very little, they have terrible eyesight, right? So their eyes are this tiny little, in this tiny little hole here. So they have tiny little eyes. They have these amazing teeth. They're ambush predators. And then just like other dolphins, they use echolocation to, to get their food, to identify where their food is. So a dolphin, a regular dolphin, another species of dolphin, um, has a big soft tissue organ on the top of their head called a melon. And the melon sends out echoes. And then the, the echo comes back through the lower jaw and travels back. The lower jaw rests right underneath the ear. Let me see if I can show you the ear back there. So you can see one ear bone right there. I don't know if you can tell, this is the, oops, I can't move, that doesn't work. The ear bone um, is right next to the tag. It's kind of a, a smooth looking round piece. Uh -huh. I just don't have a hand to point right there. Right, yeah. So the mandible goes right to the ear bone and then that tells the dolphin where their prey are located. Now with the Ganges River dolphin, and I don't know exactly why they have this, I have not um, found any research on it, but they have this bony structure, it's just beautiful. And yeah. that is, to like their melon is inside, their, their auditory organ is in there, but it's, maybe focused more directly with this bony structure, but I just think it's amazing. This one so is really other species don't have that? that no, other species, true. no, they don't, nobody else that I know of has this bone wow. on top there. 
Well, if anybody so. else knows, they can let me know that I'm wrong, but I've not ever seen anything else that has a bone on top there like mm -hmm. that. And it's kind of spectacular. Here are the vertebrae, this is the vertebral colon. So sometimes the vertebrae stay together in the box. Those are also really beautiful. Yeah. They also have seven cervical vertebrae, just like us. Hmm. And just like giraffes, giraffes also have seven. Are giraffes and dolphins, uh, re are they related more closely than other? They're somewhat hominids? related, right? Because they're um, later on in the taxonomy, um, they're the ungulates and then the cetaceans come in. And right. that's uh, because at some point, whales were on land similar. They're most, I think they're most closely related to hippopotamus. And then they went into the water. So um, cetaceans and ungulates do not have a penis bone. Penis bones are only found in certain species um, and not in, not in ungulates and cetaceans. So we we collect, but we will often collect the pelvic bones. So on a large whale um, back where they would have had hind limbs, they have a pelvis that is uh, a remnant of their hind limbs. But it's also involved in sexual selection. Some researchers recently have shown by measuring different um, pelvic bones. Mm -hmm. So it, it's also a, a place of connection for the penis in males. And then uh, the size actually can help them with sexual selection. So the ones with, I, I, my understanding is larger pelvic bones for greater um, connection to the intern. They have an internal penis. Whales do. Um, that actually plays into sexual selection. So on a large whale, we might collect some uh, broken vertebrae if it was hit by a ship or something. Uh, we might collect some ribs, but really we don't have a lot of room for big specimens like that. But on almost every whale that we work on, for us, we try and collect the pelvic bones because they're so different by individual and by age and by species. And uh, there's actually a Woods Hole researcher who has a whole gallery of pelvic bone images from a bunch of different cetaceans. And uh, we also collect the baleen uh, whenever possible and blubber because those things, like I talked about earlier, can tell us more about their life history. Whales also have an earplug, which is like a, it's, it is a waxy plug inside their ear canal that um, can give researchers, a, it also gets laid down in, in uh, specific time periods. So it can give you ages and hormones and isotopes and toxins. I've never been able to find an earplug in a whale. So is that, that's is that one of amber, my goals. Amber grease or is that some No, amber grease is uh, from sperm whales. It's their uh, poop, basically. Oh, okay. So it's a really it beautiful like name for poop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, the earplugs are way deep inside. And by the time we get to a carcass on the beach, usually it's really decomposed. And either I'm really, really bad at it again, um, or they've just, we've tried so hard every time to find the earplugs. And I'm going to find them one of these yeah, days. I believe it. Um, but it has to be a fresh enough animal that it hasn't melted away, because I think that's what's happening when it decomposes. Or they're very young animals and they were small to begin with. Um, when we get them here in the San Francisco Bay, sometimes they're younger. So I'm would, still on a search to find a earplug. Okay. All right. It's good to know. I'll like yeah. wish you cosmic earplug energy. Thank um, you. What, how is blubber preserved? Blubber we just keep in the freezer. Okay. That makes so we sense. Have, yeah. We also have a tissue collection. So for every specimen that we prepare, we save muscle and liver tissues. And then researchers can use those for genetics. So mm -hmm. you don't always have to cut a toe pad. In fact, we would prefer that people do genetics from fresh tissue 
and not from bones or um, study skins, but for the historical ones, you have to do destructive sampling. But moving forward, we collect tissues from everything. Sometimes we collect stomach contents. Um, our curator has a project studying barred owls that are coming into California and taking over spotted owl territories. Mm -hmm. And for every barred owl that we work on, we save everything. Livers have been used for um, toxicology studies to see in areas where there's uh, marijuana grows and if the pesticides and fertilizers and things that they're using are affecting the birds. Right. Um, but yeah, we save every single thing we can from those, including the whole carcass in, jar, in the jar. So. Yeah, we have, uh, and he, Dr. Jack Dunbucker did a breakfast club about that, so I can drop a link. Oh, did he? Yeah, I can cool. drop a link to that in comments too. Yeah. Um, this is so amazing. I guess I'll ask this one last question because several people asked versions of this, which is, does the Academy accept specimen donations today? Yes, we do. We, um, it's a little harder right now because of COVID. Um, but if people email us, they do have to be frozen. And like I talked about earlier, we have to know where and when they were collected. Um, those are the two most important things because that puts that animal at that place in that period of time and for research that's so important um so like if something hits somebody's window just put it in your freezer in a couple of plastic bags with a label that says when and where it was collected and then you can contact me and we'll make arrangements for a safe transfer outside the museum and is we're also working from home right is there anything um are there any species specifically that you, that you, or like how, I guess, would someone differentiate between what was valuable versus not valuable to a collection? Well, you could contact me and I can tell you, um, like, I don't expect anyone to pick up a disgusting raccoon or anything on the street because like, if it was hit by a car, sometimes the skulls are um, damaged from being hit by a car. And plus you're not going to put that in your freezer. So there are lots of common species that we're less likely to accept because of our space issues. But yeah, if you have small birds are a lot easier if, if something hits your window or um, sometimes cats will actually bring home specimens that then their owners will share with us. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe you'll get a flood of email about um, whale earplugs, but um, <laughs> if, if anyone you, finds it, no, you can't find a whale ear earplug because you're not allowed to go into oh, a right, whale. And right, plus, right. they're really hard to find. Um, yeah, you have to have special permits. But we work with the Marine Mammal Center whenever we go out to a large whale necropsy because you need a big team of people to work on an animal that big. So they take all the samples of internal organs and things for study and we work mostly on the hard parts like looking for broken vertebrae and any other broken bones that might tell us how the animal died. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we will let you go, I guess, for now, even though I really don't want to and would like to <laughs> spend the rest of the day with you. But um, I think we should definitely plan another in some of those yeah. collection spaces that people don't get to see as often. I'd love, I'd love that. People would love that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So thank you so, so very much. Absolutely. And, I love showing off the collection and talking about it. And there's so many cool things. So thanks yeah. for listening. This was great. People, people loved it and were fascinated. And I'm sure you'll get some emails. Um, Good. But yeah, thank you again. And everyone out there, take care. We'll have some new Breakfast Club scheduled soon. And thanks for watching this one. Bye for now. Yeah. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>